So, uh, about, well, that's with the making of the making of documentary. So, yeah. how much uh, footage did you have to go through to get the, this stuff? I think about twelve hours. Twelve hours. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was it was it was quite a bit. Um, and we didn't have like it was funny. It made late night look like big budget because we just had like we had a couple of um, uh, just a couple of friends helping out. Uh, David Edwards and Mike Morey uh, came out on the different shoots just to be kind of a fly on the wall, kind of like that. And then uh, we had that footage. And I was just going to do like the fly on the wall doc, that to speak for. Um, and actually, the reason why you kind of see it's like kind of we have the pauses in between. So the other thing it's actually a five part documentary that will be on the DVD coming out uh, this July on uh, with Parade Deck and yeah. all well, across North America. Yeah. Yeah. three audio commentaries on side A, and then you flip it over, you'll see this documentary, plus some really cool storyboard videos and things like that, too. So, um, yeah. but, um, and uh, yeah. as for the questions, were there anything that, that well, for the second directors, were there any questions that threw you off on the, uh, the make of the documentary that Kelly would have asked you? Or? I actually don't remember, I don't remember anything I said in the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of surreal, because I should mention, too, that, that um, the one with the, the, the poster in the back, that was actually the set of Chasing Valentine. <laughs> that was a chance. <laughs> that was and, and, um, yeah, and, uh, but Zach helped, uh, helped us shoot that, and Tor uh, Navin um, helped us shoot at that studio um, for the, the gray background ones like that, too. So thank you for helping. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. No, it's great. It's kind of cool watching it, you know, like, <laughs> it's such a nostalgic, you know, walk, walking down memory lane, like, for, for me at least, for oh, you guys, yeah. too. But watching all of the other scenes, just takes you back, you know, to, the awesome and sometimes painful, you know, <laughs> times of making the movie, you know, but good memories, they're all awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. The entire thing was just like, I knew it was going to be like this, but like, I look like that? I made that face? Like, the monitor was that close to my head? <laughs> I have a weird look when I'm focusing. I'm yeah. really struggling. <laughs> 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 like, oh, me too. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, there's, not, there's not too much live video of me, which is all uh, that kitten. Or, Two years ago, I was so fucking stressed out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Charlie is, yeah. No, for sure. No, but it was no. It, it, it's it's in, it's enjoyable to see in hindsight. And it was exciting at the time too. Yeah. But Jesus Christ, that was all. That was that was overwhelming at the time. Yeah. I'm proud of, I'm proud of all those. I mean, at the time, what you remember, because you're experiencing it, you're, you're, you're thinking about the stress and the problems and the issues you're solving, right? And, and the shots you didn't get or whatever. And then watching it now, you're like, you realize all the fun and all the good through rosy glasses. Exactly. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's great. I love that photo of uh, me bending over and, and talking to Torrent or whatever when you were like, with, you had to shove in your face. That was great. Yeah. Like, look, I was checking up on him or like, I'm going to shut up or something. I don't know. Like, stop talking, Torrent. <laughs> And was there any footage that uh, you were thinking whether I should use it on the documentary or whether I should put it in? Or oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, a lot of it was just, I mean, the behind the scenes footage. It kind of, mm -hmm. you know, it, a lot of it was a lot of shaky cam stuff. So there's only like you had to kind of work with what you had. Kind of like I said, we didn't have professional videographers, so you just kind of had to work with what you what you had there. Um, and that's why we went back. So we shot those. You know, a year and a half of interviews. That a year and a half later. So they, in a way, that was kind of more almost retrospective at the time. Usually, you do these EPKs on set, and we were doing this like 18 months later. So in a weird way, that kind of gave a different perspective. Because the interesting thing was that all three of you had already done other feature films since then, kind of thing like that. So it was very much the interviews almost. It almost had this sense of a bunch of retrospective kind of thing like that. I mean, it's. Um, yeah, it's kind of that, that was that was the interesting thing about that. I mean, I would have liked to have had more. I had a little bit of. I would have liked to focus a little bit on post production. If we could too. That was yeah. an interesting experience. But we just didn't. It was already seventy six minutes long, and it was just like you know we already had so much there already. I didn't want to cut it. I wanted to keep all you know kind of keep a much bigger conversation. When did you decide that uh, you want to make a feature version of the making of documentary? Was it already in? Planning when you shot when Blade Runner Double Feature was shot. Uh, well, I actually when when we when we were planning the film, I was aware. I, I wanted. I actually approached some documentary crews to do yeah. it. I wanted an actual documentary, a real documentary crew to kind of go in and really do this. And because I knew we were doing something kind of different, I knew it was kind of unique, and I knew if we didn't document it in some way, I really just wanted it kind of like 
we're in a very interesting time in, in cinema in Toronto. I mean, we've got all these amazing festivals, and we've got all these great filmmakers that are making all this stuff, and, and seeing like there's a real there's a real energy of it. And I think it's something that I wanted to document something like 20 years from now. We can all watch this. I think it's gonna be we're gonna enjoy this like when we're older. I think even more like it's just like just to look back at it and just to kind of document that. And so it was kind of important, but we we didn't have any. We didn't have a budget for the film, never yeah. mind behind the scenes, so it really got to, okay, here's the camera, go shoot something, and then I had all this stuff, and I just kind of wanted to do something with it. I didn't know if it'd be, like, that long, but then the funny part was, it was just, like, because it wasn't, it was more like, if you really look at it, all the all the making of them are about, you know, 20 minutes long. They're not really that long when you when you just break it up, because it's really just, like, a five part. So the funny part is I made an anthology film about an anthology film. But it's just like, <laughs> so yeah. But it was um, it was kind of it was kind of funny like that. I mean, I definitely I'm glad we got some footage of it, but I, I, I never intended. I'll tell you the one thing: I never intended to have anything to do with it at all. It was just yeah. totally just like I was going to hand it over to somebody else to do it, and it was just like, but it was just too big of a task for anyone else. Yeah. Like, not to do it. And I think uh, we could open the for the audience. So, anyone have uh, questions? There we go. Um, of course, you couldn't uh, cover every incident that happened uh, during that uh, those pressure cooker shooting days. Each of you describe uh, some sort of incident or crisis or something that uh, you're, you're personally proud of uh, helping to solve it, which you took away as a lesson and, and was able to use in, in your subsequent films. Oh man, I'd say, um, and this should go without saying as a director, but at the time it was something that was new to me, which was that, like, especially as a director, you're there helming the project, no one's going to get pissed off at you if you ask them to do something differently too many times, you know? And I, I think I was concerned, it's like, oh, I'm like young, it's my first time working in this sort of environment, I was concerned, like, you know, I'm trying to put as much of my input in there as possible, obviously, because, you know, it's, that's, that's my job. But I was concerned, too, like, and this, and, you know, like, I'm, I'm an anxious person. I, there, there were concerns that, um, you know, like, these are people around me who are more experienced, they might think, like, oh, this, this kid, you know, he, He's still figuring this stuff out, you know? Um, but, you know, in hindsight, I was like, holy shit, like, all these people were here, like, they were in my corner, they all wanted to make it happen. And that's something that I think you can only learn with the benefit of hindsight in some ways, and especially here. It's like, man, everyone was fucking there. So, no, boss people around, it's your job, make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it was probably because of such a, a time constraint. It really taught, it really emphasized to me, at least, the, the importance of being able to. Um, you know, just think on the fly and make decisions on the fly in terms of the edit of the of the movie just as we're shooting it. Uh, the final scene of Late Night Double Feature, The Big Blood Bath, for instance, that was a very elaborate shoot. There were so many moving pieces, there were so many sections to the whole scene. And what we had to do is because we were just really, really losing time and, and we had to make the day, uh, just kind of collectively coming up with, especially with, with my DP and the actors, and kind of coming up with more and more uh, if we lost the shot, how can we make it work? Or if we lose these three shots, how are we going to make it work with this one shot? And I think at the uh, you know watching it now, watching the movie now, I you know I couldn't see it any, any any differently. And I don't think anyone you know it's all in my head when I'm planning it. And if I lose it, I I'm probably the only person who's going to know it or feel it, but no one else is. So that's a good that was kind of a good lesson to me because even watching it in the edit um, after it was cut, I'm like oh yeah that works out. Great, it, it, it works, it tells the same story, it's efficient, and it's great, you know. But I know we lost four shots there, but no one else ever is. Gonna. As long as you do it properly, you do it correctly, and not fuck up, I guess. But if you do it correctly, no one's going to figure out the missing link, you're just going to join it, and it's going to be smooth. That's picking your battles. Exactly, picking yeah, your battles, exactly. exactly. That's why, I mean, um, what you mentioned in the documentary is very really nice of you, like sort of what me, our, both our styles where you're completely prepared and I'm obviously prepared but oh, not sure. but in, in a different way you know I, I do I do sort of discover a lot of things on set and rehearsals as well but I kind of like your method of having that storyboard if only I could draw like this guy you know sketch like this guy you know, I, I can't if you look at my sketches it's like you know, kind of like Sam Raimi's, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at Sam Raimi's storyboards from Evil Dead, like the evil hand looks like, it's just a bigger hand, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what my, my, my sketches are like. But anyway, so I kind of like that as well. So kind of you know, just finding the balance of what works for you, especially on a project like this where 
time and money is uh, of essence, and you know, just maximize it and just make the best out of it. You know? Sorry, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to cut you off, but just to, just to cite. I wish I could cite. This, I wish I could cite this quote properly, uh, which I, I I read fairly recently, and I unfortunately can't remember who said it. But it's like prepare for everything and then throw it all away. Because by doing that, I mean, like, yeah, I had all my storyboards, but once I got there, I wasn't yeah. using them all the time. Because, mm -hmm. like, it, but the act of doing that, and even when I'm just doing the shading, you know, you're immersed in that, in that moment, and you're, like, working things out even if you don't realize that you are. So you're just putting, you're committing the whole thing to memory. You're cramming your, mm -hmm. your scene. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, more valuable to me, just the act of doing it than actually using them. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Because, that, because you can make those decisions on set, because yeah. you know that world so well, right? You can kind of maneuver around it. So, yeah. Uh, I think the, the biggest lesson that I learned making Late Night Double Feature was the power of like teamwork. Um, I had never worked with a crew before. Um, Torn and I were, were totally used to just backyard filmmaking where we hold the camera, like I would go on his sets, hold flashlights, and that's how we would light our films back then. And now I go on to a set, we have a cinematographer, art director, we have a cast, extras, there were so many things that I was totally not used to. Um, so it was coming, getting used to that and again, like getting used to directing people and learning that you can tell people what to do and they're not going to get pissed off with you. And it was also learning on the fly to solve problems. Um, working on short films, it was a little bit easier, you're working in your backyard, it's easier to make things happen, but when you're working with a big cast and crew, for instance, our first day shooting Late Night Double Feature, or shooting my segment of Late Night Double Feature, it flooded. In, in Peterborough, and we had <laughs> literally like, it, like it was up to your hip high water. And we needed two generators for that whole barn scene that happened. And they were where it flooded. And so we had to snag these generators um, from the, Kelly's parents' place. Yeah. Sorry, right there. Yeah, <laughs> yes. he's not exaggerating about that, that when he's doing this. No, no, it was literally this high. And I, I, had to work that's, like, the, that's the one thing I wish we had video footage of it would have been great to have the video footage of you and Carl bring in the, yeah, the, the generator. I wasn't even there when that happened. Myself, Carl, and Ryan, and we were pulling like a 24-hour day and we had to grab generators from a flood this high, so we wore these big suspender pants up to here, <laughs> trenched through the water, grabbing this generator. It was like filmmaking at its finest, and that was like the best way I think we could have started the movie. And worst way, but it was it was well worth it. But again, it was a it was a great learning lesson how to work with a team in going in the trenches and going in the water. So we ended up getting the generator, both generators. <laughs> right, other questions? Um, were there any surprises when watching your lead actors reflect on your segments? Um, I'm pleased that they thought that I had it together. As <laughs> <laughs> Words. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, whenever, yeah, I, just, I have no idea what I'm saying when I'm on set. I'll just say words and hopefully it makes sense. So it's good that they help shape the film. Yeah. And Nick, uh, Nick Smith is one funny dude. Yes, <laughs> Nick, thank you for making that documentary amazing. <laughs> we took a road, road trip with him and went to Alpha for the screening of this movie once. And we I can't talk about that though. <laughs> 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 what happened to Montreal is yeah, 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 yeah. But no, uh, super, super funny guy, Nick. Any other? Well, I was actually curious to see um, what did, what specifically did you each learn from this project that you're now applying to your current projects? We, hmm, let's see here. I'm trying to think of any other any other lessons that were learned. Um, well, clearly you guys like working with the same people because watching both your films at Canadian Film Festival. <laughs> It's the same cast, but in different roles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a good thing, is like you learn who you like to work with. Uh, you learn, it because the biggest thing that I learned from working on this film is filmmaking is a family-based thing. And it's like you build that family, you build those foundations. And once you have those key family members, you always want to stay with them. And you will go through hell and back just to make a project. And that was, I think, the biggest thing that I learned from this project and projects that I've worked on afterwards. Um, for me, I think probably collectively, I think even even Kelly, Kelly and I and all of us, uh, I think the biggest thing that I sort of took away from the project, from this project specifically, is the post end of it, mm -hmm. because we shot three different formats, 
three different styles and specifically three different formats. You know, having a having a strong or sort of a dedicated post supervisor yeah. for something like this from the beginning, seeing it through till the end, would have been very beneficial too. As and that's something I, you know, I'm sure all of us would insist yeah. on yeah. on okay. the next project. That's going to be that you know a next project like this one because usually on a film you shoot with one format, one camera, so there's one through workflow in terms of post. Uh, but for this one, there were essentially three different workflows, not including the trailers and all that kind of yeah. stuff around it as well, but even just the three segments, there were three different workflows that could have been a little tighter if we had a post supervisor yeah. from the beginning. And it took a lot, because the thing is, too, is it, it made it good for us, because I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the people on the team, except for Navin, most people hadn't made a feature film before, so... Um, we, you know, we were. It was great doing the anthology because you could do it as little shorts. But then when you had to put pieces together, and that was like, oh, okay, now this is where it's going to get really common. So I do have some footage about that, and I would like to maybe even just put it up on YouTube, like a little making of like of the posting because that was a very interesting journey of like what we went through with that. I mean, it was, you know, we 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 did. It, I think it turned out really, really great. But it was kind of like that was probably the biggest learning curve I certainly had as a producer I was like whoa that was kind of like that was kind of very complicated because especially because when it's something like this where you um, you know you had different teams and stuff like that working working mm -hmm. together but working together but not it was kind of like everyone was kind of doing their piece of it and, and then bringing it all and together. then bringing it together I mean just to get how the insanity of it I mean we were in with our sound designer George Flores and he had black leader like on the film of where the trailers were going to be we were doing posts and I hadn't done Night Clown yet. So there was like, no, no, I know what I'm gonna put in there, don't worry about that. <laughs> Just like, and then we would pop in that thing. Like, we, I literally picked up the car from the sound designer's house, went and shot Night Clown, returned, returned because it was my, Gavin Michael Booth who was doing his post for Scarehouse. I borrowed his car, came it back the next day, back to George's, and then, you know, and then a month later or so, we threw that footage in. So that's how I'm crazy, which you never would do. You would, you, when you lock a movie, you're supposed to lock a movie. You're not supposed to <laughs> go, go, and, go, <laughs> go, go, and go through it with a key. key. I mean, it was kind of getting like into Lord of the Rings, like Return of the King <laughs> stuff, where you're adding stuff in after, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Another question. Yeah. Um, um, I really enjoyed a lot of the music and the soundtrack. Uh, it was great. Who was... Uh, each director take charge of that, or how was that put together? And those we have choices. Some of our composers made. here, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Stephen. Yeah. Hey, yeah. All the musicians are. Oh yeah, all, all musicians are right behind you. Yeah. 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 Uh, and to answer your question, yeah, I think uh, each of us did our own sort of thing. We had. I, I know Nick and I worked together on my segment because Nick and I had worked together on uh, One More for the Road. And, uh, and yeah, him and I have sort of a shorthand, he kind of knows my style. And speak just um, on, on my segment, I usually, like music is a huge influence for me, so I had a very sort of specific idea of what I wanted, and then Nick and I just kind of worked on it, and that's, that's, how, that's how it happened for the Dr. Nasty segment, and these guys did it oh, yeah. separately too. Um, yeah, I don't know, I've, I've worked with Stephen on a project that I've done before, this film called Mail Ice Mouth Car, which played here at your festival yes. <laughs> a couple years ago. Um, so we had that we had that working relationship there already, and he learned to hopefully deal with my quirks and work for the directing soundtrack. So I was like, hey, dude, please help me because I don't know how to score this thing myself. So there you go. Um, but no, it was it was really just you know like taking where I knew that his skill sets were. Um, he had previously been involved in an ambient band in town called New Wings. Would you call it ambient? I hope I'm like classifying your genre correctly. Sweet. Uh, and I knew that you know soundtrack is often you know a case of arranging not necessarily melodic elements but different sets of sound, and that's a lot of times what ambient music is like. So that was that that seemed to be a logical extension of his of his skill set. So there you go. Uh, and Nav and I had the same composer, Nick, and uh, for my segment. It was super last minute that we got to Nick, so he didn't have a super long time to compose the score, but from that tight deadline that he had, he composed something that just really brought the whole film together, and it makes you realize how powerful music is as a, as a glue to keep a film together, and uh, I think he kicked ass, so thanks, Nick. And we ended up working on a feature together afterwards. Well, actually, I should mention, Kelly did send me some notes as far as sort of, sort of roundabout, so it, it, it certainly helped, but yeah, it was... 
Uh, Time-wise, it was scary. I think you had about a week or so to no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, put a lot a week. Five days. Five days. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't see him for three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So our offices are together. <laughs> and, and an interesting little thing. And then, and then for the documentary, I repurposed uh, their music for this kind of that too. So I was. It was really interesting to actually listen to the full cues, and I was just kind of going and doing loops. And it was fun to take. Um, I don't know if you heard it, but I put music from Slit in other segments and then stuff from Dr. Nasty and different monsters. Like I was kind of playing, I was being playful with it when I was putting it in. So I hope I did okay with it. But I just like, but I, I put that into the doc. So it was really interesting to listen to the cues really in depth, like in a way that I had, because I was just listening to it like when we finished, oh, that sounds great. But I really was to kind of listen to those cues over to it and then piece them, uh, do kind of a, like do with the sound design. Some of the some of the music that's in this movie is some of my, some of my favorites. Actually. I think we should yeah. talk about uh, getting a soundtrack album together. Yeah. I think that'll be yeah. kind of, You should yeah. also make note. Uh, where is she? Oh yes. She did the vocals. Rose did the vocals. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. When Rose came to my studio, basically all I knew was I was she, she sang opera. That was it. So I was like, I was thinking, okay, how's this going to work? How are we going to pull this out? But she did incredibly well. She nailed it. So, it was yeah. funny because I did everything you're not supposed to do. I was smoking cigarettes. I was drinking whiskey <laughs> right before because you did this grunt sound for it. And it was, yeah, so but you were cute. Nick was amazing. And you did. Bang it out. You did fantastic. It was it was yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, I love it. And yeah. and the and what was really interesting about that was was just like Nick just said, oh, uh, for the closing music, I would like to get some a vocalist in. Of course, we had no money for a vocalist. And I'm like, well, Rose can sing, and she's like, she's, <laughs> she's sang with um, uh, you know the Toronto Symphony and things like that, and they're just like that kind of stuff. And I thought it was going to be like kind of background, oh, like this kind of thing, like the background. <laughs> and I hear it, it's like this rock song. I like the lyrics, and just like belting it out, and just like singing with vampires and all this kind of crazy what stuff. What do you think it was, Kelly? Background ready? That's my vocal. I did sneak that in, though. I did sneak, actually, yeah, because we were doing yeah. the stuff, and I'm like, yeah, it was pretty yeah. funny. Well, so when, you fir when you first mentioned I thought, oh, here we go, he's going to get his nephew in. <laughs> <laughs> Can I maybe take one more question from the yes, um, question for Kelly about how you chose Zach and Torin and if it felt like a risk to put such substantial resources into such young people. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's a really valid, that's a really valid question because um, what gave me comfort, honestly, was the structure of the film because. Uh, it was intentional that I went with the director for the wraparound, like Navin, who has frankly more, more, you know, more. Had, I, I worked with him on one more for the road. I, you know, there was no, that was the, that was the, that was the share hand kind of thing like that. What I had complete faith in them, but it was at the same time it was the film within the film thing, and so it was kind of like it. So if it got a little kind of quirky, I was actually and nobody, I never actually told anyone this. But I was going to cut away to a whole bunch of stuff, like news reports and a whole bunch of stuff, all the way through, if it completely fell apart. Like, I was going to have, you know, it wasn't just going to, I mean, kill mortgage race me through it, kind of thing, as one, as this one thing. But I was going, but that was just kind of fun way to, you know, yeah. But we did have a, a, a tonal beat where it was just sort of like the tone changed so drastically. And you said, hey, this would be a good spot for it to get interrupted. And then it was great, so because the tone shifts, kind of like, it's so wacky, and then it goes right, to, if you saw it right through, it goes serious. So the commercial, Kind of fix that in a strange way, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I, but I, but, but I, you know, the great thing about it, I, people who don't know, I run the other festival, Horror Festival of Blood in the Snow, and the great advantage is I have air, I have played all of their films, kind of like that. Uh, I, I knew Torn for the film Fondue. Obviously, um, so I worked with Navin before, and and Zach with with Dead Rush, and um, and we showed that the, the short film in 2013. So I'd already seen their stuff before and I knew that they had that talent and they just had that real kind of drive and energy and and just to kind of take it full circle here, I mean it was just such a it was so satisfying to see you guys play your films last week at KM Film Fest. I can't wait to see your anthology oh, film that you're finishing up. And Four years. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. But no, but I mean I, just, I was just really proud of these guys to like that too, because they you know, you know, we're talking documentary about how great screening their streaming was like even more crazy as far as the attendance and like that too. So it was really fun so that was very satisfying as a producer to kind of feel like, hey, 
that, you know, I, I obviously I got the right, because, you know, if they crash and burn after one, I'm like, I can pick the right team. But, <laughs> but they did a really, I thought, I thought all three, I'm so happy with the team. I could not have done it with any other team than these three guys and everyone else that worked on it. And I think that was also what was fun about it. I like the fact that we were all kind of new at making feature films. I mean, everyone had film experience, but most of the people, I believe, you know, yeah, that was Carl's first feature film. Um, our production designers, that was her feature film for a production designer. Um, uh, like uh, costumes, like I really like that too. Like uh, it, there was a lot of people that had film experience, but not like this. So it was a great segue from doing shorts to, to features. Kind of a proving ground, I'd say. In yeah, this too, as a way to take those skills and put them into a project that would you know, take it take all next, to the next, next year. Time, yeah. So yeah. And it was cool too, because I mean, like obviously, like there's you know differences and ages between all the people in the project, but we were all sort of united in this being our first time doing mm -hmm. something like this. So it, like. That was sort of taken completely out of the equation. We were all in it together, so that was exciting, mm -hmm. for sure. Really briefly, what's next for each of you? Well, I'm gonna make a documentary about the documentary. <laughs> 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 uh, well, I mean, uh, we still. Uh, it's really funny because I'm watching these guys. We've gone all made I've been getting this thing all done. But I, uh, um, we have five more screenings of Late Night Across North America Woo! coming up. Sioux, like Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, Shelbyville, Indiana, Philadelphia, <laughs> Niagara Falls Comic Con, a whole bunch of like that too, and then the DVD will be in July, and then we're on to the new feature. Hopefully, we're gonna start shooting in January. So, um, I just finished my feature film, Dead Rush, which we played last week at the Film Fest. Um, I don't know if we can but we'll we'll see. Some cool opportunities are coming up, so. You guys, <laughs> you guys especially. Um, likewise, I had my next film, Chasing Valentine, play at the Canadian Film Festival exactly a week ago. Uh, so I'm promoting that one, I'm touring with that one. Um, and yeah, just reading tons of scripts and trying to lock in my next feature film project, which uh, has me locked in. Yes. I'm perpetually trying to finish an anthology that I started <laughs> shooting four years ago. And it's a backyard DIY production of a series of uh, grotesque Halloween rituals. Uh, all told without dialogue, um, so that's hopefully going to be finished mid uh, mid summer at this point. And the plan then is to, uh, with my friends in the DIY music community, is because you know I think that there's a lot of parallels between independent film and independent music. Now you kind of have to wreck it yourself, and you have to take it directly to your audience. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, to get together a band of musicians to provide live, provide live soundtrack to this thing and play through basement venues across like southern Ontario. Um, and I don't know, I think that that'll be a more direct way in some ways of reaching the audience that might enjoy this type of film. And I'm trying to get a music video done for next Friday, switch me on the butt guys, because I'm going to be strapped to my computer for all of next week. So, yeah. Thank you very much for coming.